This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Friday, so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. From time to time, I like to look at specific sets in these Top 10s, and that's what we're doing today. But we're not going to be looking at an ordinary set, we're looking at Modern Horizons. We'll be getting Modern Horizons 2 later this year, so it seemed like a good time to take a look at the original and how it's impacted competitive magic. Modern Horizons was a supplemental set that was released in June of 2019. Normally, cards from supplemental sets skip Standard, Pioneer, and Modern, and they're only legal in Legacy and Vintage. But the cards in Modern Horizons, as you can tell from the name, were of course legal in Modern. They chose specific cards to put in the set that they thought would shake up Modern and... Well, as we'll see from this list, they definitely succeeded if that was their goal. Most of the cards on this list have also had some impact on the Eternal formats too, so the set was definitely powerful. Modern Horizons had 255 cards, and of those cards, 209 of them were brand new, and 46 of them were cards that were from older sets that weren't legal in Modern. For this video, I decided to focus only on the 209 brand new cards and not on the reprints. I usually exclude reprints when I look at specific sets, but I think it was extra useful to do here, because if we limit ourselves only to the new cards, it means that all the cards in this video have had the same amount of time to gain points, as they were all released at the same time. Alright, before we get to the top 10, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A top 8 at a Pro Tour, Players Tour, Mythic Championship, Mythic Invitational, Legacy, or Vintage Championship is worth 2 points, and a top 8 at a Grand Prix or Magic Fest is worth 1 point. At number 10, it is Ice Fang Coatl. In Modern Horizons, the blue-green draft archetype was all about snow, and there were some new snow cards that really shook up multiple formats, and the Coatl is one of them. The snake basically becomes a better Baleful Strix if you have at least three other snow permanents, and that's a good comparison, because Baleful Strix is a heavily played card in Legacy, and as you probably guessed, the decks that have played the Coatl have no problem getting there on snow permanents, as just running snow-covered lands isn't a very big cost, especially because there's some nice payoffs out there. While it has been modestly successful in Modern, Legacy is actually where Ice Fang Coatl has been the most dominant. It was featured in some powerful four-color control decks with a snow sub-theme. Now, one of the key cards in that deck did end up getting banned, but I still think it's possible for the Coatl to continue to be relevant in Legacy, especially since the very similar Baleful Strix still sees play there. At number 9, it is Nurturing Peatland. There's a whole cycle of dual lands like the Peatland in Modern Horizons, with each of the enemy color pairs receiving one. And while they've all gained points, the Peatland was the only one with enough points to make it on this list right now. This whole cycle is pretty great. They provide fixing while also allowing you to cash in the land later to draw a card, and that's often what you want to be doing in the late game, especially if you're flooding out. The upside is definitely worth paying some life to produce mana. Nurturing Peatland has gained points in both Modern and Legacy, and it and the rest of the cards in this cycle are likely to continue to do that. They're just really nice lands. At number 8, it is Urza Lord High Artificer. So, it took a long time for us to get a legit black-bordered card that depicted Urza, one of the most powerful characters in all of Magic's lore. And yes, I know Blind Seer is Urza, but it also isn't. It's him disguising himself, so the card isn't actually representing Urza. Urza Lord High Artificer does, and it really doesn't disappoint. Urza really likes artifacts. He makes a construct when he comes down that gets bigger the more artifacts you have. He makes it so all of your artifacts can tap for blue mana, and then you can use all that excess mana for a strong activated ability that lets you play the top card of your library. Urza helped spawn an artifact-based toolbox deck in Modern. It teamed up with fellow Modern Horizons card Goblin Engineer and War of Invention to make it so the deck could easily search up whatever artifact it wanted to disrupt the opponent's game plan, before assembling a combo for the win. In particular, you could combine Urza with Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek to gain as much life and make as many Thopter tokens as you wanted. Urza is one of the few cards on this list that doesn't have any points outside of Modern, but it's pretty likely to continue to gain points there, so that's probably okay. At number 7, it is Arkham's Astrolabe, another snow card from Modern Horizons. This looks like a pretty unassuming card. I mean, it draws a card and filters mana. Big deal, right? Well, yeah, it turns out it was a pretty big deal. Usually when we see cards like this, they look like Prophetic Prism, which is the same card except it costs twice as much to cast. So paying one for a card that replaces itself and can filter mana is actually really good. 
This is especially true in decks that can get value out of artifacts or snow. It's been played alongside Urza Lord High Artificer, giving you a source of mana for Urza when it comes down, and it helps you dig into your library for the combo pieces you need, while also helping out the other cards in the deck that have artifact and snow synergy. The Astrolabe has been played a ton in Legacy, where it is paired with Ice Fang Coatl and 3 and 4 color control decks. Ultimately, the Astrolabe made mana too good, and it made decks too consistent, and for that reason it got banned in both Modern and Legacy in 2020. It's still legal in Vintage, and still seeing a tiny bit of play there, but the fact that it's been banned in its two main formats may mean that it won't gain very many points going forward. At number 6, fittingly enough, it's Ren in 6. Wizard's first attempt at a 2-mana Planeswalker didn't go so well, with Tybalt the Fiendblooded considered by most to be the worst Planeswalker ever. Wizards took another crack at it in Modern Horizons, and because they could skip standard with cards in this set, they could push it a little harder, and what they ended up with was Ren and Six, so they definitely designed a powerful two-mana walker this time. Ren and Six has a plus one that can ping creatures, and they can also return lands from your graveyard to your hand, like fetch lands or utility lands, and they also have a pretty sweet emblem that gives your whole graveyard retrace. Ren and Six's ping effect in particular has had a very real effect on the formats it's legal in, because it makes creatures who are X1 seem really bad, and as a result, fewer and fewer of those cards are being played. In Modern, Ren and Six has gained points in Jun, Scape Shift, and Four Color Ramp. He's also played in Legacy, where Canadian Threshold is his most frequent home. This is a deck that tends to load the graveyard quickly, and Ren and Six's ability to get back lands is particularly potent there, especially if you get back a land that can destroy other lands. Ren and Six's effect on Legacy was so big that it ultimately got banned out of the format in 2020, and that means it is our second consecutive Modern Horizons card to get the ban hammer in at least one format. Ren and Six also has already impacted Vintage, where it's played in decks like Rug Planeswalkers and Teamer Midrange. It is still in Modern and Vintage, and for those reasons, Ren and Six will probably gain more points going forward. At number 5, it is Hogak, Arisen Necropolis. This is probably the most infamous card from Modern Horizons, as it had such a major impact on Modern that it completely warped the format and had to be banned, which means that Hogak is the third card on this list to get banned somewhere. Hogak has a pretty cool design, but one that should have given R&D playtesters a few red flags. It has two abilities that help reduce the cost of the card between Convoke and Delve, and the latter ability has proven to be busted on numerous occasions. But hey, in Modern Horizons, they wanted to have fun with designing super strong cards that can make an immediate impact on Modern, so I guess they sort of succeeded there. Except that Hogak ended up being completely insane. It's way too easy to rapidly load the graveyard in Modern and not that hard to fill the board when you do it, and this led to Hogak coming down insanely early, like on turn 2, with regularity. Hogak was only legal in Modern for two months before getting banned, but put up 18 points in that short span. Being banned out of Modern doesn't mean the end of Hogak, though. He has found success in Legacy Dredge decks, too, where he's really good, but the rest of the format is powerful enough that he doesn't seem like he's in imminent danger of getting banned or anything like that there. He's going to continue to put up points in Legacy going forward. At number four, it is Collector Oaf. The Oaf is a pretty sweet hate bear. That is, a 2-mana 2-2 that has an effect that hates on some specific strategies. In this case, the Oaf makes it so artifacts can't use their activated abilities, something that is pretty crippling for some decks. This has led to it being a common sideboard card for green decks in Modern, Legacy, and Vintage. In Modern and Legacy, it shuts down key cards like Aether Vial and Walking Ballista, just to name a couple of cards, and in Vintage, it can even shut down the Moxon. The Oaf looks like it's in great position to continue to accumulate points in those three formats. It's one of the best sideboard cards around. And number three, it is Force of Vigor. Modern Horizons had a whole set of Force cards that are modeled after Force of Will, but they're powered down a little bit compared to that Force, because you can only cast them as pitch spells on your opponent's turn. If you use them on your own turn, you still have to pay for them as you normally would. And while that certainly makes them worse than if they were more exact replicas of Force of Will, they're all still pretty darn good, because not paying mana for things is pretty powerful. In this case, you get to disenchant a couple of things. This means that even if you do discard a card to pay for it on your opponent's turn, you aren't even going down on cards. You're getting a 2 for 2 and not paying any mana for it, which is a good deal. Now, of course, Force of Vigor isn't good against all opponents, and for that reason it's mostly a sideboard card, but it has quickly become a key sideboard card in Modern, Legacy, and Vintage. All of those formats have many powerful cards that Force of Vigor can destroy, and that has allowed it to already have a pretty impressive score, and it's a score that's just going to keep going up. It's pretty much unrivaled when it comes to efficient targeted removal for enchantments and artifacts. At number two, it is Plague Engineer, another sideboard card that hates on a particular strategy. In this case, the Engineer really hates tribal decks. Modern and Legacy are both formats where tribal decks are a pretty big presence, 
humans in modern and elves in legacy, and the engineer really wreaks havoc on both of those decks. While it isn't quite as potent against Eldrazi, they're a presence in those formats as well, and the engineer is pretty good against them too. It also hates on any deck that is really focused on 1-1 one -one creature tokens, so it's also a good counter against the Thopter Sword combo I mentioned earlier in this video. The prevalence of those decks means the engineer has been played a whole lot since being printed in 2019, and because the effect is one-sided, it can even be played in mirror matches. It's going to continue to gain points in both formats, and it has a chance at surpassing the number one card on this list, which is... Force of Negation. It's part of the same cycle as Force of Vigor. Force of Negation is a way powered down Force of Will. It can only counter non-creature spells, and it can only do it for free on an opponent's turn. It does also exile the spell and cost less to cast than Force of Will, but overall it's still a weaker card. But... Again, it turns out Power Down Force of Will is still really good. It's played in most blue decks in Modern, and in Legacy and Vintage, it's often played alongside Force of Will, giving decks even more copies of a free counterspell. Force of Negation is going to continue to be played a ton, and I think in the long run it will probably outpace Plague Engineer, but we'll have to see. For now at least, it's the card from Modern Horizons that has left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Well, those are the top 10 Modern Horizons cards. I think it's safe to say that the set was a powerful one, with three of the cards on this list needing to be banned in at least one format. It will be interesting to see how Modern Horizons 2 goes with the legacy Modern Horizons has left. If you want to own any of these Modern Horizons cards, in the description you can find a direct link for each of them in the Card Kingdom store. If you enjoyed this video, like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you stay aware of future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to catch up on past MTG Top 10s, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Also, if you enjoy listening to me talk about magic, consider checking out my other YouTube channel, Nietzsche Hone History, where I put my PhD in history to use. Thanks for watching.